Okay. So when we talk about hope being right here, as you are called in the hope of your calling, there is a hope of your calling. In your calling, there is a hope that you get to experience when you are walking in your calling. Okay. So in Romans 8.28, it says, uh, what does it say? Let's see if I can remember it. Um, for all things work to the good for those who are who love God and who are called according to his purpose. God works all things for the good for those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. That's hope. So when when we are loving God, seeking him above all things, Matthew uh, 6.33, seek the kingdom of God first and he shall add these things to you, right? When we are seeking him first, uh, when we are loving God and we are called according to his purposes, like Romans 8, 28, we get to experience this supernatural hope, this supernatural ability to have a confident expectation of coming good despite the surrounding circumstances. That is what's available to you as you begin to walk worthy in your call. But you need to be in your call. This hope, for you to experience it, is as you are in his calling and in your calling. When you walk in your call, you get to experience this kind of hope. When you are walking and you just have a confident expectation of coming in despite surrounding circumstances. Praise the Lord. So that's the hope of your calling. All right, so Roman, uh, now let's go to verse 7. So now we're going to get into like a different, it changes a little bit here. So Paul talks about walking worthy uh, in a worthy manner of your call. He breaks that down a little bit more of what our calling is, what it looks like to walk worthy. But then it changes subjects here more into the call rather than the character. It gets a little bit more deeper into our calling. Okay, so let's go deeper. In uh, verse 7, it says, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. This is Christ's gift. This is gifts from Christ. We have gifts from the Father, we have gifts from the Son, and we have gifts from the Holy Spirit. We have gifts from all three. Romans 12, you'll find Romans 12, uh, 1 through 7. You'll find that it talks about the gifts from God. Now the gifts from God, whether you're a believer or not, you have them. Just by being created in, the, in His image, you are created by God, therefore you have things, qualities of God in you. So this is why you'll find you know, unbelievers who are gifted in teaching, leading, um, you know, wisdom, whatever. And they don't have the Holy Spirit. But they're gifted in it. Why? Because God created them. They were made in His image. So you have the gifts from the Father. The gifts from the Son right here in Ephesians chapter 4. And then gifts from the Holy Spirit is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 to 11. And it talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, um, it talks about the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, um, different kinds of healings. Um, those gifts are not gifts that we own. Those are gifts or manifestations of the Holy Spirit. In verse 11, it says that He distributes these as He wills. So it, these are from Him. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. The Holy Spirit can be quenched. So if we grieve and quench Him, those gifts that come out from Him are also grieved and quenched. So if you want to see more of those gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, 1 to 11, if you want to see more of those gifts manifesting through you, then you need to be co-laboring with, with the Holy Spirit because those are His gifts. Okay? Um, okay, verse 8. Therefore it says, When He ascended on high, He led captive a host of captives, and He gave gifts to men. This is huge right here. Because there's so many people and, and so much uh, a part of the church that believes that there's no more gifts, that you know, all the gifts, the power stopped when the Bible was written. Um, a lot of churches don't believe apostles and prophets. They just operate with their pastor, and the, the pastor teaches, and will, you know, talk about evangelism. But we really need an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. We need people who are gifted in those areas to all pour into the church, to equip the church. Okay, not just a pastor who is talking about those other things. You need people who are gifted by Christ in those functions um, to to pour into the body, okay? So, but this the important thing here is that when did he give gifts to the men? When did he give these gifts? It says, when he ascended, 
he gave these gifts. When did he ascend? When he resurrected, right? After he died. So he died. He went to the lower parts of the earth to set the captives free, right? The people who had died before Christ in faith, but Christ didn't die for their sins yet. So now he went, released them, pronounced, declared victory over the enemy. I've got the keys of, of, of power of life and death, right? So he went, descended, did that, and then he ascended. As he was ascending into the heavens, he gave gifts. So these gifts, which in verse 11 tells us it's a prophets, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, those gifts were given after he died, after he ascended. Okay? So this is totally separate than the apostles and prophets that have already been established. This is something totally different. The apostles and prophets were already established. They already were functioning, called by God, but called by Christ, walked with Christ, did what they were called to do. But now here's Christ. He died. Now he's resurrecting. Now he's sending the Holy Spirit and he's giving gifts to men. This is totally different. These are our new set of gifts for the body, for the benefit of the body. Why? To equip. Okay, we're going to get deeper into this. Let's go to uh, verse 11 now. So what are the gifts that he gave? After his ascension, he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. Okay? So what are these gifts? What were these gifts given for? Why did Christ give these gifts to the church? Why? Next verse. Verse 12. Why? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. So that is why he gave these gifts. To equip the saints. So as being a pastor, a prophet, whatever, if you're called to be one of these, you are called to equip the saints. It's kind of like working yourself out of a job. But there's so many leaders, so many pastors who are not equipping their people out of fear of losing their job or fear of somebody else being better than them or, you know, so many things that can come into play into this. But just know that you're called to equip. You are called to father and mother other people to make them better. Better than us. We want to equip people so that they can do more than us, right? We want to lift them up, empower them. So these are the gifts that he gave. For what? For the equipping. Now how long are these gifts, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, how long are these gifts supposed to be around? How long are they supposed to be equipping? Are they supposed to still be equipping today? Let's read the next verse. So verse 13, it says, until. So how long are they supposed to be around? Until we all attain the unity of the faith. Have we gotten there yet? No. Until we have the, uh, of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Have we reached any of that? No. So that means that these gifts are supposed to be operating and supposed to be equipping still, right? Amen. Um, so yeah, so what, what would be the result? What would be the fruit if pastors and leaders were actually doing what they were called to do? What Christ has given those gifts for? What if you and I begin to really equip people and begin to train people how we were called, how we were called to, right? What if? What would happen? Verse 14. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed and here and there by the waves carried about every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, by craftiness of the deceitful scheming. So that would be the fruit. All this is the fruit of people getting trained. They'll, they'll be mature. They'll be more stable in his word, be more stable in him, right? Verse 15, 15, uh, 15 and 16. It says, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up into all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fit, fitted and held together by what every joint supplies of each individual part, causing the growth of the body for the, bo the building up of itself in love. This is a huge part of our call of just insight into what you're called to do. Amen. All right, so again... These are around until we reach the fullness of Christ. We haven't reached there yet. What would be the result? 
if we did equip people, if we were really equipping people, the result would be that they'll become more stable, more firm, more mature. They're not going to be speaking things out of fear of their own pain, but rather they're going to speak the truth in love. Amen. Um, so verse 15, there's a, a little uh, part over here that I want to highlight. It says, we are to grow up in all aspects into him. Well, how do we grow up into all aspects into him? Well, there is a, a spiritual truth, um, a principle that is true, that says that every seed produces after its own kind. Think about that. Every seed produces after its own kind. So if I want to grow an apple tree, what am I going to plant? An apple seed. Amen. Pretty, pretty simple, right? So if I want to grow into Christ, what do I plant? You grow the seed, right? You plant the seed of God. So let me read a couple of verses for you here. 1 Peter 1.23 says, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. Okay, now verse uh, 1, uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. No one who is born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. Seed. Remember? A seed will produce after its own kind. So if we have the seed of God, we have the Holy Spirit in us, we're not going to keep sinning because that doesn't. that's not what that seed produces. An apple seed will produce an apple tree, not oranges, right? So the Spirit of God is not going to produce sin. It's going to produce righteousness. It's just... How it works. Praise the Lord. So that's how we're going to begin to grow up into every aspect of Him is by being intentional of what seeds we're planting in our life. What thoughts? What things are you saying? What things are you doing? All those things are seeds that will produce something into your life. So pay attention to your to what you're thinking. Pay attention to what you're speaking out because it's going to come into existence. Okay? So know that you have the Spirit of God, the imperishable seed. The, the Word, the Bible, is the Word of God, is the seed. So the, this is where we get seeds that we can plant into our way of thinking, into our heart. Amen? So plant some good seeds so that you can grow some good fruit. All right, verses 20 to 24 um, of, Eve, of Ephesians 4, okay? Uh, I'm going to start at verse 17. I'm going to read through 24. So I say... So this I say, and affirm together with the Lord that you and I walk no longer as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. So he's saying we no longer walk like this. He's not putting you down or telling you what to do. He's saying, hey, 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 this is how it used to be. Okay, so pay attention. Don't get religious when you read this and beat yourself up. Hear what he's saying. So we no, we no longer walk as Gentiles. Verse 18, we're no longer being darkened. In, you know, in our understanding, excluded from life because of ignorance, because of the hardness of heart. That's no longer true for us. Verse 19, And they having become calloused, having given themselves over sensuality and practice of every kind of impurity and greediness. Again, that's not going to be for us because that's not the seed that we have in us. Verse 20, But you, but you and I, not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him, and have been taught in him, just as the truth is in Jesus. So he's saying, if you have heard him, if you have gained from his instruction, his teaching, if you're truly hearing him, his word, his voice, if this is true, if you're really receiving from him, um, verse 22, in the reference of your own manner of life, you will lay aside your old, your old self. So if it's true that you have heard him, the result will be that you... Lay aside your old self, your old man, right? Which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. And you being renewed in the spirit of your mind and have put on your new self in the likeness of God and have been created in righteousness and the holiness of the truth. So we have been um, called to put on our new selves. We are our new creations. Amen. We are new creations. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 16 and 17. 
So we are new creations. Um, let's go.